Let's talk about some canopsic creations and destroyers, quantum shielded vehicles and katan shards, with an overview of some of the strengths and weaknesses of every single Necrons unit. Hello and welcome back to All Specs Tactics, where today we're talking Necrons, and in this video I thought we'd go through each and every single unit in the Codex, talk a little bit about their place within the army, and a few strengths and weaknesses of each datasheet, and give them a very rough overall power rating out of 10 for how stride rank them in the army at the moment. Necrons are certainly a very powerful faction in 40k right now, I would argue that the vast majority of their datasheets are at least usable, though there's still some iconic stuff that could do with a bit of help from Games Workshop, and certainly some things that are maybe overshadowing so much that they're oppressing some of the rest. Still with being one of the stronger armies in 40k right now with a few viable builds, it's not the worst time to be putting the Soldiers of the Two Worlds onto the tabletops. Jumping straight in, let's talk through most Necron squads, then the Destroyers, then look at Vehicles and Katarn Shards, and round up by looking at Characters and then their Forge World datasheets. First up, we have the Rank and File Necrons in the Necron Warriors. Their iconic battle line infantry choice for 100 points for 10 of them, or 200 for 20. These guys are fairly cheaper model compared with what they've been before, though their abilities were massively reduced in the Codex. What they can bring is some cheap objective control, fairly good durability with a toughness 4 and the 4 plus save, plus a big unit that's good for receiving buffs like toughness cryptex, and regardless of which flavour of Gauss weapon you pick, they can stack a fair few lethal hits on the enemy, meaning the phalanxes can be quite good against lighter infantry, but also at least chip a few wounds off tougher stuff. They do have their small buff to reanimation, though it's been massively toned down compared with what it was before. They were certainly far more intimidating with that when you could get D3 plus 3 wounds returned to the table. Otherwise, for weakness, their damage output just really isn't all that exciting, with Gauss Reapers being toned down from strength 5 to strength 4. That certainly hurt the value of a big squad jumping out of Deep Strike. They're fairly slow moving and are only really truly effective in quite a short 12 inch sort of range, which can give them problems of having all those shots locked up in close combat unless they have a Royal Warden along. And on the durability front of things, some things with mass blasts will absolutely wreck them. Overall they just seem a little bit mediocre compared with the competition. I feel like if Games Workshop want to keep these stats they probably need to cost a little bit less. I've overall chosen to score them a 6 out of 10, certainly vastly outcompeted by Immortals in competitive lists. Speaking of which, the other Necron battle line are the Immortals, 70 points per 5 of them, and these tend to be the guys that get built around for competitive, plenty of good character options, generally have a choice between leading warriors and Immortals, particularly the various flavours of Cryptek can give you some really good value here, things like Plasmancers and Sustained Hits, or Chronomancers, Move Shoot Move and the Minus 1 to Hit. They've got strong options for buffing them in most attachments, including things like Canoptek Court, with Cryptek rerolls and things, or Hypercrypt having them jump around the table, maybe with a Plasmancer attached, and it does seem that both Tesla and Gauss are very viable, depending on whether or not you want the lethal hits and AP, versus just sheer mass volume fire. Personally I do prefer the Tesla a little bit myself though, their inbuilt reroll rule against enemies on objectives is pretty strong as well, certainly lets them stack a lot more wounds there. For weaknesses, their damage output isn't really very general purpose, it's going to be fairly limited against things that are toughness 6 or higher or 2 plus save or higher. I'd say that while their durability per point isn't bad, it's not really standout either. Just one wound even if it is at toughness 5 and 3 plus save. Again, if you are investing with them, being tagged in melee can be annoying as well, as you could be locking up a whole ton of shots there. Still though, if you want a ranged damage dealer that can take some very good character buffs, they still seem to be great. I've chosen to give them a big 9 out of 10 here. Next up we've got the Lich Guard, an infantry choice for 85 points per 5 of them or 170 per 10. These guys changed in character rather enormously with the Codex, now maybe just being very nice as a pretty cheap and tanky unit. 17 points per model for 2 wounds with a toughness 5 and a 4 plus invulnerable is great on its own. If you do choose to put a character in the unit, which I'd say maybe isn't mandatory, you also get that rather nice minus 1 to wound as well, making them even tougher. Their volume melee attacks with those hyperphase swords are pretty good against most targets to chip away. They might be quite nice for Imitet the Stormlord in particular, seem like quite a nice guard for him to march forward and keep those command point generations safe, and they'll get a bit more bonuses out of the Abasance Phalanx, though it is rather unfortunate that that's considered significantly underpowered compared with, say, Canoptic Court and Hypercrypts. For weaknesses, I'd say their damage output is sort of middling, it's only really their durability that stand out, not being led by Cryptex is a bit disadvantaged compared with the Warriors and Immortals. 
and for a tanky unit that kills infantry, they'll be competing with raves pretty hard. They basically do the same sort of job as Lich Guard, but can move a fair bit faster. Out of the two, they see a lot more play. Definitely still not useless though, I'd rate them a 7 out of 10. Next up, we have the Jump Infantry squads of the Triarch Praetorians, 120 points or 240. For Necron Elites, if you're comparing to Lich Guard, they can move at least fairly fast with Fly, and could deep strike to do secondaries and things, and provide a bit more threat than, say, death marks. Both their loadouts will have fairly good damage against most infantry. I'd be a bit more tempted by the particles and the swords over the staffs, though they're kind of similar. And maybe could be a bit better with the Abasance Phalanx once more, or if the Silent King is nearby. I feel like they are a unit that's just a bit overcosted, though. 120 points just doesn't really add up to the stats of any one Triarch Praetorian. Neither their damage nor defence is good, and their speed isn't standout. If you want frontline infantry, again, race will probably do their job better as infantry bullets, and not being able to access any character leader options is a big negative. It'll stop them being able to use quite a lot of fun combos. Between all that, I feel like they're really quite overshadowed. I've chosen to rate them a 5 out of 10 here. Next up, we've got the Death Marks, an infantry choice with 65 points per 5 of them. Really quite nice to pay 65 points for a cheap unit with Deep Strike to drop in for secondary objectives. Depending on what it is that they're dropping in to do, if it's not an action, they could still contribute a bit of firepower with the sniper rifles. A bunch of strength 5, AP2 and damage 2 shooting can be threatening to marines, and they do have that rule to intercept characters if it ever makes sense to try and gamble on that. Otherwise, they're at least fairly tanky per point for 13 points per the body, and they're quite an interesting unit in hypercrypts, able to repeatedly warp around the board with inbuilt deep strike to get where they need to. I still think it could be kind of funny to do a bit of a meme build with a big deathmark hit squad with several units just warping around the board, just obliterating one target at a time. Not really the most sensible, but maybe kind of fun. Again with these guys, they have no character leader options, which stops people building around them as a synergy thing in lots of detachments, and their precision shots I think have a lot more relevance in some games compared with others. Plenty of characters out there, just a bit tanky to be really threatened by these guys. So they're pretty nice in small numbers for squads to drop in and do secondaries and things. I've chosen to rate them a 7 out of 10. Next up we have the Interference Little Nuisances that are the Canoptet Scarab Swarms. A 40 point Swarms choice per 3 of these here. I just filled them in the minimum size unit. They're a cheap objective control zero secondary objective screening units that can just be put out into the midfield to force people to deal with them. They do bring plenty of wounds to the board for really quite cheap. They have lethal hits in combat and the option to self-destruct to at least threaten enemies with a little bit of damage output where needed. The Canoptic Court rerolls plus lethal hits can make them punch up a little bit more effectively with that, but they're still not going to be outstanding damage dealers at all. They can be objective control worn if there's Cryptex nearby. Kind of depends on how many of those that you might have about though. And just as cheap nuisance units, it seems sort of hard to go wrong with a couple of units of these. As for downsides, they don't really have good damage as mentioned, while they're at least fairly tanky per point I think, they do have the disadvantage of just about anything in the game being at least fairly good at killing them, both anti-tank weapons and mass volume fire can do work. Being objective control zero some of the time is a bit unhelpful for just putting them on objectives without support, and if you do want just an absolute minimum investment unit, you might be better off with individual locust destroyers, 30 points apiece for a unit that isn't exactly standout, easy to kill as a cheaper unit with a big gas cannon mounted on it. I still think they're very usable though, they do have the advantage of being a bit faster than those Locust Destroyers. I've chosen to rate them a 7 out of 10. Next up we have the Sinister Flesh Coated Flayed ones, 70 points per unit of 5. The main thing that they bring is being able to infiltrate another cheapest unit that can do that. Infiltrators are kind of handy to have around to potentially screen and shut down a whole load of scouting and enemy infiltrator shenanigans in one part of the board, plus potentially threatening first turn damage or just sitting on objectives. The only other Necron options are the Canoptic Acanthrite and the Canoptic Court Enhancement for a big unit of Wraiths. On top of that, their damage output is genuinely pretty great against lighter to medium infantry. They'll average 17 hits at Strength 4, AP 1 and Damage 1 with Twin Linked. That's going to stack a lot of AP 1 saves. Most hordes will get fairly quickly blended, and they've got a reasonable chance of killing their points in Space Marines, depending on what they get into. They do also come with a stealth special rule as well for a minus one to hit. For downsides, their durability really is quite weak. 14 points per warrior body just isn't great for that. Even with stealth, they're going to be easy to take down for a small unit of five of them. Otherwise, they are kind of slow. 
and high toughness and high saves units will make their damage drop off quite a bit. I'd rate them as a unit that you probably want in small numbers, if at all, to take the midfield and do screening things. I've chosen to rank them a 7 out of 10. Next up, we have everyone's favourite murder buckets in the Crypt of Thralls, a 60 point infantry choice that you get to attach to a unit that has a Crypt tech with it. They're not exactly a very efficient damage or defensive unit in their own right. Perhaps the main advantage is to make the squad bigger so it's got more wounds and more likely to survive to reanimate. Plus you have a few more bodies to buff and more melee threats if the unit does wind up in combat. Plus the three wound bodies can be quite good for tanking damage 1 or damage 2 that might have otherwise killed an entire model of Necron Warriors or Immortals. Unfortunately I really don't think they did them any favours in the update in the Codex. They're less durable against most threats compared with when there were 2 wounds and a 4 plus fill no pain. They can't join Lich Guard and their damage is pretty bad per point even if they do have a little bit of threats to help out their units. I guess could maybe be a luxury choice if you just wanted to build a really big tanky unit like a warrior squad with all the trimmings. At 60 points though I really don't think that they're worth it. I've chosen to rank them a 3 out of 10. Next up for the high tech Necron jet bikes we have the Tomb Blades. 70 points per unit of 3. In the codex they became a bit more fragile but gained a fairly great move shoot move rule meaning that they can move really quite fast towards the enemy with both their movement and then a secondary move to get them even further towards where they want to go. Plus they also have the scout move to go forward and take the midfield early. Means they should be able to threaten to get into the right places to do secondary objectives when needed. And otherwise can spend some time on midfield objectives maybe pinging out, shooting and hiding again. Contributing a little bit of meaningful damage against lighter infantry. Otherwise though I wouldn't say that they're units to over invest in. The durability is quite weak if they're caught. Their damage output isn't exactly stellar and isn't that relevant against anything that isn't lighter infantry. And they're not really seen as a unit to build around to any great extent. No character options again not really helping with that. Maybe one or two units as cheap utility options weighed up against all the other things out there. I wouldn't go too much heavier than that. But I do think that they're quite good for that role. I've chosen to rate them an 8 out of 10. Next up we come to one of the powerhouse choices of the Codex in the Canoptech Wraiths. A beast unit for 110 points for 3 of them or 220 per 6. A very nicely tanky frontline unit with 4 wounds, toughness 6 and a 4 plus invulnerable. Really quite likely to survive to get the chance to use reanimation protocols if they're in numbers. And they can take the Technomancer for an ear or to include 5 plus feel no pain. They're fast enough to catch things that they want to. And their damage I'd rate as sufficient to bully most normal sized infantry units between the particle beamers and those claws with strength 6 and damage 2. They will of course absolutely love the Canoptech Court with the big rerolls that it gives them, makes them much more convincingly dangerous. A quite nice units to sit in the midfield and establish the power matrix that do get OC2 each. And I feel like it's a very tempting choice to have a big score of 6 infiltrating and can just cause a massive problem for a lot of opponents as they charge into the enemy deployment zone turn 1. I feel like they stand out in Canoptech Court, though still pretty great in the other places. Awakened Dynasty with a plus 1 to hit is nice and could be a nice anvil unit in Hypercrypts. Something to move forward and tank hits on the midfield objectives while everything else fades in and out of existence. Perhaps their biggest weakness is that their damage output is pretty low per point. They won't be wiping out any notably tanky units. But overall I feel like they're a hard choice to pass up. I've chosen to score them a 9 out of 10 here. Next up let's move on to the destroyers. And first up we have the Scorpex. 100 points for 3 of them or 200 for 6. Armed with their brutal hyperphase weapons. These guys have mass strength 7 AP 2 and damage 2 attacks with devastating wounds for a once game punch with the plasma sights. Their special rule allows you to reroll hits on the charge which is rather nice. Genuinely quite good damage against medium infantry there and enough volume attacks to threaten heavier stuff a bit. They're a core unit of the Annihilation Legion which has some genuinely good support for them. It's just a shame that they're basically the only unit that that supports well. In theory anything that could deliver them into combat without having to take enemy fire could be nice though. Maybe things like the disembark from a monolith and still charge in hypercrypt. For downsides they're really not all that tough per 33 points. Perhaps a bit unreliable to deliver before taking shooting damage as well. And some things do wreck them rather nicely. Without support they will struggle to punch up at least a bit against anything that's toughness 8 or more as well. Likely to get a fair few failed saves but probably not enough to take down most battle tanks in one round of combat. 
Overall, I feel like they're usable, though kind of overshadowed in most optimised lists. I'd score them a 7 out of 10, probably going up to an 8 out of 10 in Annihilation Legion, though. Otherwise, their counterparts are the Ophidian Destroyers, again 100 points for 3 or 200 per 6. They move fairly fast and have inbuilt Deep Strike, and their main trick is to tunnel on and off the board. Perhaps the biggest reason to take them is to have one squad jumping around doing secondary objectives. Though that tunneling trick is kind of redundant, as everyone can do that in Hypercrypt, so a less good there. Like the Scorpex, they can get a bit of support from Annihilation Legion as well. I would say they probably don't really have the damage output to be a big frontline unit like the Scorpex though. Only strength 4 means they're just far less relevant against a lot of mid-toughness targets. And even more so than the Scorpex, their defences just kind of stand out bad for 33 points. Not too hard to take down. Overall, I've chosen to rate them a 6 out of 10. Maybe not awful for the redeploy thing, but I feel like Necrons have a lot of better utility units out there. For the shooting destroyers, we've got the standard Locust ones. These are a mounted choice with Fly, 30 points per model, and you can get 1-6 to six of them. They've got fairly good general purpose damage output with nice rerolls built in, a bunch of strength 5, AP 2, and damage 2 shots with lethal hits. Kind of powerful to combo lethal hits with 4 rerolls against things on objectives. Their durability I'd say is a bit middling at 3 wounds, toughness 6, and a 3 plus save. I feel like there's a couple of fairly viable ways to run them. You could potentially field them in individual models for 30 points, which is just handy to have for doing things like secondary objectives or screening space on the board. Not bad to have cheap units like that that can actually genuinely contribute to damage output and won't die to a stiff breeze. Or you could potentially build big with, say, a Locust Lord for enhancements. I've seen a fair few people doing that in Hypercrypt. For weaknesses, they are kind of short range and you don't really want them to wind up in melee if you can avoid it, if you're actually focusing on their damage. They will be quite a bit weaker against anything that's toughness 6, and particularly things that aren't on an objective marker. At least lethal hits keeps them somewhat relevant against those though I suppose. I do quite like them and I feel like having a few of these just at 30 points individual units is rarely going to be a bad choice. I've chosen to rate them an 8 out of 10. Long live the last hurrah of the Necrons with the green rods. Otherwise, their bigger, chunkier, and recently sculpted counterparts are the Locust Heavy Destroyers. 50 points per model, and you can get 1 to 3 in a unit. You get the choice either between the enormous Gauss anti tank shots with a big damage 6, or the Enmity Exterminators for infantry killing with sustained hits, and built in re rolls for either of them depended on their ideal targets. Out of the two, more people tend to lean towards the Gauss over the Enmitic. I've certainly seen the Enmitic ones used, sometimes with a Locust Lord. Again, they can be particularly interesting in Hypercrypt, redeploying when they need to to get line of sight, so the opponent can't guarantee that they can hide from these big nasty guns. For downsides, more so than the standard Locust, they're really not particularly tough for the 50 points per model, though at least maybe can keep the enemy at long range a little bit more than them. Compared with standard Locust as well, I'd say that both types of firepower just aren't really all that flexible. They just kill their one thing really well, whether it's tanks and monsters or light one wound infantry. But admittedly, they're both fairly good damage outputs depending on the firepower that you want. Overall, I've chosen to rate them an 8 out of 10. Kind of not too hard to use in big firepower, big damage things that want to be hitting the enemy first. Next up, we're moving on to the Necron vehicles, and first among these, we have the Annihilation Barge, 115 points for a light quantum shielded vehicle, striking with its twin Tesla Destructor for a whole bunch of AP0 damage 2 stacked hits, quite capable of stacking some saves with those sustained hits and twin links. It's got fairly good range, comes with a bonus weapon of a Tesla cannon or a Gauss cannon, maybe can be quite nice with anything out there that could give it some solid shooting boost. The Silent King's rerolls or the Phasal Subjugator, if you have either of those, would certainly be welcomed by this guy. If the enemy's got a clustered up formation as well, we might have a fairly reasonable chance of getting a few mortal wounds out of each gout of firepower with them, which is kind of fun. For downsides, they're pretty weak against killing things with high saves. Both their damage and defense are kind of so so, I think, for the 115 points, even if they're going for fairly ideal targets. And they do have plenty of other Necron firepower to compete with, which is far more capable against things with high saves or high toughness. Still though, I don't think that they're awful just to spit out a fair bit of low AP firepower if that's what you want. I've chosen to rank them a 6 out of 10. Talking of heavier firepower though, we've got the enormous gun that is the Doomsday Arc. 200 points worth of Doomsday Cannon, 
Lots of big scary strength 18 shots with devastating wounds and a flat damage of 4. Getting heavy and access to those devastating wounds if it's static. For the 200 points I don't think the durability is terrible with 14 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable save. Maybe not stand out good though. And it does get its bank of 20 gauss flare shots if enemy infantry get within range of it. The downsides it still can be a little bit swingy with its damage d6 plus 1 shots. But I feel like it's within acceptable levels compared with previous when the two sets of d6 really didn't help it. Its damage output does drop off a bit on the move more than most things. And it will be competing against other things like Locust Heavy Destroyers and Doomstalkers, both of which can threaten tanks well. Overall, I'd probably rate this guy somewhere between a 7 or 8 out of 10. I feel like for raw stats, it does actually compete fairly well, but maybe you'd be more tempted by the Doomstalkers in the Canoptech Court and perhaps the Locust Heavies in Hypercrypt. Though I feel like if detachments weren't a particular thing, this guy would be fairly competitive with the both of them. Next up, we have the Triarch or Oversteer that is the Triarch Stalker. 125 points for a Walker vehicle. I think I typically choose the Heavy Gauss Cannon for this guy. Six attacks at Strength 8, AP 2, and Damage 2, stripping cover from one unit that it hits. And then, interestingly enough, it gets an 18 inch scout move and has a little bit of melee threat with those four limbs. Realistically, though, even with the Strength 8 shooting, the damage is kind of bad for the cost, I think. The cover debuff I think is merely okay, plenty of Necron anti-tank stuff has okay AP so it's not the end of the world if you don't have that boost, and I feel like you need an awful lot of dedicated Necron shooting to even make this a maybe choice, perhaps if you've got pure heavy gun line Necrons and you really want to focus firepower then one's a good idea. I feel like the scout combo is just really kind of off with this and it's just a bit confused as to what it wants to be doing, it doesn't really want to be on the front line in melee. I feel like for forward deploy stuff you're probably better off with infiltrators or maybe tomb blades or the big infiltrating base squad in Canoptech Court. Overall I feel like it's just a little bit of a strange unit that few people are going to pick first. I've chosen to rate it a 4 out of 10 here. Next up we have the Healer of the Tomb Worlds in the Canoptech Reanimator, a vehicle choice at 75 points. The main reason to take one being it's the single best reanimation boost in the Codex in my opinion. Plus D3 wounds healed per reanimation activation is still pretty meaningful and that could combo with other things that activate reanimation protocols in unusual ways. Its durability at rate is fairly good for the cost. The on paper stats of 6 wounds at toughness 6 with a 3 plus save aren't great for 75 points but given the 4 plus feel no pain you on average have to chew through 12 of them. I'd say that's good enough to be considered pretty strong. And particularly given that when you heal the extra D3 wound yourself, you've got a really good chance of just pinging this straight back to full health. It's not really something your opponent can afford to half kill if they want to bother attacking it at all. The main downside is that its damage output is really quite low, so you're not getting much value there. And the reanimation buff that it has is really short ranged at just 3 inches. You are going to actually have to follow the thing around that you want to boost the reanimation for, rather than hiding it in a ruin or anything. Necrons are just a bit less hyper-focused on reanimation stacking than they were as well. Maybe a bit less chance of units being so crazily tanky that they just bounce damage. But for certain units it could still be pretty interesting. I feel like if you ever regenerate an extra D3 wounds on a Catan shard or something, then that's going to be a big feels bad for the opponent. Overall I feel like the boosts are really powerful one, but given that it's so short range it's kind of limited, I'd choose to rate it a 6 out of 10 here. Next up we have the War of the World style walker that is the Canoptech Doomstalker, 135 points for a really big gun on stilts, it's Doomsday Blaster, will strike with strength 14, AP 3 and damage 3, it has the option of a 5 plus overwatch, it's durability being kind of fine with 12 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable save, and of course absolutely loves the full rerolls from Canoptech Court, which it should be able to get really reliably by keeping to the deployment zone, even if for some reason you couldn't push out the power matrix to the midfield. I feel like it perhaps is a unit that is just far, far more interesting in Canoptech Court compared with outside the full rerolls to hit is an enormous boost, and either having it or not having it is big. I feel like it's in the position where I'd rate it as probably some of the better Necron firepower in Canoptech Court, but probably not worth it compared with Doomsday Arcs or maybe Locust Heavy Destroyers for its role if you're outside that. Its damage output is quite a lot more efficient against elite infantry compared with pure anti-armor as well, so that is something to consider. I wouldn't say that's a terrible thing in itself really. Overall kind of hard to give it an arbitrary points rating as I feel like this more than just about any other unit is really detachment dependent. 
maybe an 8 to 9 in Canoptec Court, perhaps a 7 to 8 otherwise. Next up, we have the Canoptec Tomb Spider, 75 points per model for another Canoptec vehicle choice. I'd argue that this one's really quite an interesting utility unit. A 6 plus feel no pain for vehicles is nice, maybe particularly if you're running a monolith where it's kind of tempting to take one just for boosting that. Otherwise it gets a Gloom Prism, which can be good, some good psychic defense in the right matchup. Things like Thousand Sons in particular, maybe other armies like Grey Knights or Tyranids might not thank you for having that on the table. It might be able to heal Scarabs if that's relevant, though often might not be if they're just rushing around doing nuisance things in small units. And beyond that, for a support piece, I'm actually kind of impressed by the amount of damage it gets. Plenty of spammed particle shots that can be quite nice against hordes with the blast keywords, plus the claws do have some meaningful melee at strength 8, AP 2 and damage 2. Both of those get far more efficient in the Canoptec Court, of course. Overall, I feel like it brings a lot of kind of interesting stuff to the table. The main weakness maybe being that it's just not really all that hard to kill for the cost. If the enemy does want it dead, it won't be too hard to achieve. And it is fairly slow with 5 inch movement. And the damage output I describe as good for a support piece, though not great for a pure damage dealer. Still though, I think there's enough stuff to make it interesting. It wouldn't be a wrong choice, I think, for a single unit, particularly if it's got some meaningful vehicles to make tougher. I've chosen to rank it a 7 out of 10 here. Next up, we've got the Necron Transport in the Ghost Arc. 125 points for the Warrior Taxi. This thing gives you one way to move Necron Warriors from your deployment zone into the midfield to put them all over objectives, score some points, and then it has its nice reactive reanimation type rule to allow you to heal some Warriors when the enemy attacks them and contributes a whole bunch of Gauss Flare shots downrange, should be enough to seriously threaten lighter infantry, or at least stack a few saves on top of things. For 125 points, its durability I'd rate as very good, 14 wounds with a 4 plus invulnerable save is hard to take down. I think the main issue with the Ghost Art though, is its use is kind of entirely tied to how good warriors are, and given that general consensus is that they're really not that great at the moment compared with Immortals, the use case for this guy is kind of slim. Its buffing rule tended to be far better when it could resurrect D3 plus 3 warriors with their reanimation each turn. And warriors have a few other ways to get them into the midfield if you really want to. The Chronomancer can allow double moves to allow you to get towards midfield really quite quickly. And so could the Overlord with the Translocation Shroud. Though I guess he's a little bit better with immortals that can advance and shoot. Overall though, given that it's fairly tough, gives a meaningful boost to its units plus some anti-infantry firepower, I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with the Ghost Arc. I just think it would be a lot more interesting if Warriors feel good. For that reason, I've chosen to rank it a 6 out of 10. Kind of fine, but not going to get taken if Necron Warriors aren't strong. Next, we've got the Necron Titanic units, starting out with the Monolith for 350 points. The Great Big Space Pyramid of Living Metal and Blackstone is Toughness 13, a 2 plus save, and with 22 wounds. Lots of anti-tank will be wounding it on a 5+, plus, and it's kind of easy to get cover with that big profile. Certainly not something that most armies are going to find trivial to take down. On the damage side of things, I think it's at least fairly solid. A bunch of death rays plus the particle whip, and maybe a surprising amount of melee with that portal of exile. As a big, tough, and dangerous unit, it can be quite nice for any support that you can give it. Say a Canoptic Spider, a phase or Subjugator, or any stratagems that work on it. Its Eternity Gate special rule is nice to support infantry, maybe rescue them and bring them back to the monolith to allow them to strike again or get them out of a dangerous situation. In particular, the monolith is a focal unit for the Hypercrypt Legion, given that you've got more options for deploying things in strategic reserves around it, it can deep strike itself, plus you have no less than 4 stratagems that only work if you have a monolith on the table. As for downsides, I guess most of the time it is fairly predictable, unless you're doing big brain moves with it, teleporting it into the enemy deployment zone. It can't really hide well, so we'll usually be taking the anti-tank damage that the opponent has to offer. I'd say that in general its damage and defense are just kind of fairly costed, rather than desperately stand out for the points cost. In particular, any big focal units in a Necron's army do have to compete with the kind of spectacularly under-costed Catan at the moment. And there's only really so much room in an army for big dangerous stuff. It is kind of interesting that in Hypercrypt Legion it doesn't seem to be auto-include. Lots of armies do choose to run it, though certainly not everyone. It's not like it's not viable to run that detachment without a monolith. And that's kind of funny given how many stratagems it has supporting one. 
Overall, definitely can be playable and competitive. Quite a good space for the monolith to be in, I think. I've chosen to rank it in an 8 out of 10. Nicely balanced for a fairly iconic super heavy. Otherwise, for giant space pyramids, we have the obelisk. 325 points for a very, very tanky unit. This thing gets Tesla spheres to give spam damage against light infantry. A debuff rule that gives you minus 2 to move, advance and charge now. And is admittedly kind of cheap for a titanic model. I feel like if you were matched up against these, they'd be kind of a pain to deal with. Not exactly the thing that you want to be dealing damage to, but could actually cause some disruption and wipe out some lighter objective scoring units. Maybe not quite as utterly unplayable as the internet might seem to think, but I feel like it is absolutely solidly outcompeted, unfortunately. It's just hard to really consider this seriously versus the Monolith or the Tesseract Vault, as they're both relatively cheap upgrades compared with this, but you just get so much more damage. I guess with the low-ish damage output that it has against certain armies, it just does run the risk of being ignored all game, and the enemy just focuses on everything else that you have to offer, at least beyond any anti-tank that's convenient to try and deal with it. Overall, unfortunately, it still is considered maybe one of the very most overcosted Necron units, I've chosen to rank it a 3 out of 10 here. Next up, we have the vault but opened with a katana and shackled within. The Tesseract vault is a bit pricier than the previous two. It's still very tanky for the cost with 24 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable save. It does miss out on the toughness 13 of the previous two though. Rather than clever tricks or melee damage like the monolith has, it just has a fair bit of interesting shooting. The Tesla Spheres again give you some spammed damage against light infantry and then you get two or three big scary Katarn powers. Most likely it's big torrent attack plus antimatter meteor, though you could flex into a bit of character sniping with Time's Arrow. With the way that that one works there is a reasonable chance of just one shotting an enemy character if it gets range and line of sight on them, which is pretty intimidating. Again like the other big space pyramids it's quite efficient for any stratagems or buffs that can affect it meaningfully. For downsides, compared with the others, it's got an absolutely enormous profile on the board with those pyramid sections spread out so far. It can really struggle on certain terrain setups. On some set terrain maps, you just might not be able to move it around anywhere meaningful. It is going to be in somewhat direct competition with the monolith, which I think between the utility and the damage it brings is kind of even, and in hypercrypt, the monolith is going to be the right choice. And as with the others, there is the competition with Katarn as big investment tanky damage dealer type units, which are generally considered some of the most undercosted things in the game. Overall, I've chosen to rank it a 7 out of 10. Kind of rare to see it in competitive armies, though I feel like it's really not too far behind compared with the Monolith or the Katarn. If nerfs happen to those, I feel like you might see a few more people running it. The Necron Air Force next, and first up we have the Night Scythe. A transport vehicle aircraft for 145 points, a big transport capacity to take any one Necron infantry unit regardless of size, and it has its special trick to arrive turn 1 into the game by strategic reserve rules, and then disembark units for a safe alpha strike, that bit clarified by FAQs to the game that Games Workshop did in the latest balanced data slate. Beyond that it's got a bit of spammed Tesla damage with the twin Tesla destructor that it has, and its invasion beams allow pretty interesting options for protecting units by re-embarking them after they've shot. Can be an interesting way to keep a Necron unit somewhat protected, and maybe set up for a big move and drop the following turn. Overall I do think it's kind of interesting, though it is paying a big premium for its movement tricks. It really isn't that tough for the cost whatsoever, and the opponent could just gun it down. Having no flexibility and having to start off the board is a little unhelpful, It'll only be able to come in by strategic reserves on the edges of the board turn 1 and then it's got a locked movement flight path as per standard flyers after that. I think for most units I'd be more tempted just to take more copies of that same unit. Say if you had it with an immortal squad you could take a second one. I feel like maybe one of them could be interesting for its fun movement tricks. I've chosen to rank it a 5 out of 10 overall. Sort of interesting but also really quite costly for the profile it brings for that fun stuff. Otherwise, it's maybe not too dissimilar for the Doom Scythe. Again, a flyer that has some interesting things, but is also at a massive points cost for what it brings, 230 points. In a Necron anti-tank damage comparison I did on the channel a while back, it does actually stack up in a not too unfavourable light versus groundbound things like Locust Heavies or the Doomsday Arc. 
They might have a bit of an advantage if you fire the Mighty Death Ray against one hard target and use the Tesla to mow down some lighter things. Its special rule is to allow you to make your opponent choose between a debuff or more damage via extra sustained hits. Not unhelpful, but I guess the opponent will always choose the thing that's better for them, which does mean that it's a perhaps less powerful rule than it would sound. Unfortunately, while its damage output is okay, I feel like the platform that it delivers it on really isn't that great. It must wait till turn 2 off the board, and that's something that you could do with the other shooting units, but most people choose not to, so you can threaten damage turn 1. And then when it turns up, again it has its locked movement path, and far more so than the Night Scythe, it's just ridiculously fragile to enemy shooting, it's not that hard to kill. For those reasons, while its damage is okay, I just much prefer to use some of the various good non-flyer anti-tank options on the ground. For direct big gun shooting, destroyers, doomsday arcs or doomstalkers, I've given it a 5 out of 10 here. Finally for the vehicles, we have the Necron Fortification in the Convergence of Dominion, a multi-deployment fortification unit at 60 points per star steel. The main boost that this gives is a 6 plus feel no pain for nearby infantry squads, theoretically could affect a fair few squads if you had many in range. And then a little bit of actually okay meaningful shooting with its transdimensional abductor. Three shots at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 3. Though are only at 18 inch range so you're not likely to be in range of things at the start of the game. I feel like at least compared with just about any other fortification in the game it's really quite cheap and effective for its cost. It is fairly tough at 7 wounds at T9 and a 3 plus save. And I feel like overall maybe not awful if you just have one for a very infantry heavy army. Still though, I certainly wouldn't declare it stand out good or anything like that. A 6 plus feel no pain is at best an okay buff. Maybe saving 1 or 2 immortals from a squad of 10 if they're hit by damage 1 weapons. And if they're hit by multi damage weapons that drops off really quickly. To get good value out of the durability boost it would require infantry units to cluster up as well. And this thing's a mobile so you're not going to have much choice of board positioning. Realistically for most army lists I feel like the pros are outweighed by the cons and the points cost. I've chosen to give this a 5 out of 10, maybe not awful to have just one in the list if you did happen to be playing some sort of silver tied Necron infantry force though. Next up we come to those scary scary Catan shards, and first up we have the Catan shard of the Nightbringer, a monster character choice that's also an epic hero, so you can only thankfully field one of the things. I feel like as soon as everyone saw the new Catan stat lines in their Necron codex, they'd know that they need to go up by a fair bit of points but then Games Workshop just opted not to. As a result, they're perhaps considered some of the single most undercosted units in all of Warhammer 40k right now, mainly just due to absolutely abnormally high toughness, a 4 plus invulnerable save, halving any damage that comes in at them, a 5 plus feel no pain, a big toughness 11 so it's kind of hard to wound them in the first place, and then getting normal Necron reanimation protocols so those fantastically hard wounds to take down will gradually regrow over time. I'd say their durability is the standout bit, though their damage is certainly pretty awesome as well. The Nightbringer in particular I would likely rate as the single best all round damage dealer. Really solid shooting with the gaze of death that can stack some big damage against vehicles. Aside of the Nightbringer for some high strength attacks at a big damage D6 plus 2. Again will wreck heavy targets there and does have a sweep mode. It even just throws around a whole bunch of mortal wounds at the end of the fight phase. Beyond that, he's even the cheapest of the Catan at 255 points, and while their main weakness is they're slow moving and might be able to be kept back from the enemy, if you play them in the Hypercrypt Legion, they can do things like warp up to the front lines or drop behind the enemy lines with their 3 inch deep strike stratagem, so scary stuff there. Even just advancing into the midfield and threatening any one midfield objective is a pretty big scary use of them as well. I feel like there's absolutely zero chance they don't get some sort of nerf in the next balance data slate, but until then I'm giving the Nightbringer a 10 out of 10. Otherwise though, the other Gatan are all pretty standout amazing in their own right. The Deceiver is maybe the least played of them at 265 points. He still definitely has his merits though, arguably being the single most tanky of them as he gets stealth built in for a minus 1 to hit. He gets a character sniping attack and a bunch of flat damage 3 melee that makes him one of the best against terminator equivalents. And he also comes loaded with his rule to allow you to redeploy 3 units before the game has started. 
can be kind of handy, though it is before first turn is decided, so it's not like it's a full knowledge redeployment or anything. Out of the Catan, he is the one that's played the least competitively. I've chosen to rank him an 8 out of 10 as a result, just due to competition from his brothers. If there were some sort of massive points raises to the rest of them though, I'm sure that he'd take centre stage. Next up, we've got the Void Dragon. Besides the Nightbringer, he's the other really good all-round damage dealer. Voltaic Storm when shooting, plus an anti-vehicle spear attack, a damage d6 plus 2 melee attack, again with anti-vehicle 2 plus built in, plus some tail blades for some volume fire, and his special power is a sort of vehicle cursing one that it can allow to rip some health from one. Just given high strength, huge damage melee, plus a bunch of anti-infantry things though, he's still enormously general purpose, even if there don't happen to be any enemy vehicles around, he's just stand out great against them. Along with the Nightbringer, he seems to be the other one that's most commonly played competitively. Again, I'd give him the full 10 out of 10. At their current points cost, I feel like it's basically impossible to go too far wrong with throwing a Nightbringer and a Void Dragon into basically any Necron list. Finally for the Catan, though also another standout strong unit, is the Transcendent. He's the single most expensive at 275 points, though does have the advantage of not being an epic hero, so if you want to go for some obscene Catan spam, you could potentially have six other things. He's kind of interesting in that he trades a bit of general purpose damage output for his warping ability. His seismic assault plus his melee are generally kind of good at killing medium to heavy infantry, though less good against monsters and vehicles. But he gets the rule that when he advances, he gets to warp to another section of the table, potentially giving your opponent a katan to deal with on the front lines from turn two. It's still relevant in Hypercrypt as well, where the Deep Strike keyword means that it's got more freedom to set up, as opposed to just the edges of the battlefield. For downsides, his damage output is a bit less, it's not quite as just all-round threatening to big tough stuff compared with the Nightbringer and the Void Dragon. His points cost is a little bit higher as well. Compared with the others, I'd rate him as maybe not quite a standout rather than the Nightbringer or Void Dragon, but still just absolutely immense value for what he brings. I've chosen to rank him a 9 out of 10 here. Next up, let's talk through some Necron characters. I will start with Overlords and Nobles, then do the Cryptex and the Destroyer characters. First up, we have Zarek the Silent King himself, 420 points for a rather enormous Santa Beast character with his two Triarchal Meneas. Really quite a big defensive profile for his points cost, with a huge amount of wounds with his 2 plus save and 4 plus invulnerable, plus the Meneas can be kind of good for absorbing big damage weapons for the first bits of damage that he takes. For a character with some good buffs, he's got some good damage output of his own, strong shooting, particularly the flat damage 6 Meneer anti-tank shots, plus some pretty good melee with 12 attacks at strength 8 and damage 2. I'd say his best buffing rule is his shooting one, allowing you to reroll hit rolls and wound rolls of one for nearby things when shooting, including his own damage output, which is rather nice. Otherwise, you can swap to ignores modifiers or a melee buff, and he also keeps the overlords in line with a leadership boost as well. Overall, I feel like his points are in actually quite a good place. Not really overcosted for what he brings, though maybe not particularly stand out when there's things like Catan to be had out there. Again, as with the monolith, there's maybe only so much room for big centerpiece models and Necron armies. I feel like we'd see him a bit more on the table if Catan weren't so undercosted. Could be interesting with Necron gun lines in particular, particularly things that don't get innate rerolls. Overall, I'd rate him a 7 out of 10. Fairly impressive personal stats and some fun buffs. Next up, we have the standard Necron Overlord. 85 points for your Necron generic leader captain type equivalent. He has a bit of an okay melee threat can bring a resurrection orb to the squad that he has for a big one-time punch of what model's getting back up again, and is quite tanky compared with the Translocation Shroud version with his minus one damage built in. Compared with that loadout as well, he's got some slightly more flexible war gear, though the Tachyon Arrow and the other options may be a bit less played, not really seen as essential by a basic melee weapon and a res orb. His big boost is to hand out the free battle tactic stratagems, which can be good for things like the command point reroll, as well as whatever you've got in your detachment. It does mean that he's kind of detachment dependent though, as to whether or not there's good stuff for him. He is also going to be competing against things like cheaper cryptex that might offer some slightly more direct buffs to the squad, durability things in particular. In general though, if people are looking for overlords, I feel like it's kind of hard to pass up the advantage of the translocation shroud one. 
The fond new model with the Overlord half warping in and out of existence is 85 points, so the same as the generic one, offers most of the same stuff with a melee weapon and a res orb. He just swapped out his durability special rule for the ability to auto advance 6 inches and move through enemy units. It's perhaps particularly popular if you want a lord to lead the Tesla Immortals into battle, as you can get that big movement to get to an objective and still open fire. Overall though, maybe not the most different in the world, some of the time the movement boost might not actually be all that helpful or desirable. Still though, if you want some free battle tactics for the Necron Battle Line or Lich Guard, he's alright for that, I'd rate him an 8 out of 10. For the named overlords, we have Imitech the Stormlord, 100 points for the Faerun of the Celtech Dynasty. Imitech's strategic command allows him to farm some command points, one extra one generated per turn, that's particularly nice for any of the detachments that are very reliant on their CP. I feel like both Hypercrypt and Canoptic Court have things that are interesting enough to want as many CP as possible. Otherwise, he's got a fairly solid shooting and melee profile. Once per game, he can call the storm for a big flare of close range mortal wounds. Maybe he could be an interesting enough character to go alongside some cheap Lich Guards to get that melee profile up in the enemy's face as he generates his CP. For downsides, I guess the biggest negatives are that he doesn't really do too much for his squad besides his actual own personal melee threat, and there is a bit of a conflict of interest between getting him to deal his damage and keeping that command point generation safe. Might just mean that you want to play a bit more cagey with him than you might do otherwise in the first turn or two at least, until a fair bit of his value is being realised there. Overall kind of fine as a command point battery that does some other fun stuff, I've chosen to rate him an 8 out of 10 here. Next up, we have Trazen the Infinite, a 75 point unique overlord. And unfortunately, basically the only meaningful thing that he brings to the table, in my opinion, is the sticky objectives rule, which while it certainly isn't a bad rule, I feel like maybe struggles to justify itself for a full 75 points, particularly as everything else that he has is a bit mediocre. His damage output isn't very good, he doesn't give any damage or defensive buffs to his unit, and his surrogate host special rule, I feel like, isn't a particularly interesting one. It's a bit clunky to trigger and doesn't just automatically go off when he dies, and even then you're kind of likely to be replacing a Necron character of similar or greater utility to Trazin when he takes over someone else's body. Overall kind of a shame to see perhaps one of the most fun Necron characters from the lore have fairly subpar rules like this. I've chosen to rate him a 3 out of 10 in-game. I guess maybe sticky objectives could be alright in Hypercrypt theoretically. It still feels a lot to pay for that particular rule though. Next up, we have the Royal Warden for 40 points. This Obgonda Mortal allows his units to fall back, shoot, and charge. That's particularly nice for warriors or immortals trying to take the midfield. Often they want to be standing on objectives and might well wind up in combat with the enemy trying to take them out. Ideally, the plan would be to tank the damage, fall back, and then shoot them in the face. Otherwise, his Relic Gauss Blaster contributes a little bit as well for a bit of damage to shooting. He has a once per game cancel battle shock, which isn't the worst to have on midfield objectives, and he is the cheapest leader character that you can have in the army list, maybe nice enough in Awakened Dynasty, or if you just wanted someone to literally just bear an enhancement. I feel like there's nothing massively wrong with him, though he is in just good competition with a good number of characters, particularly the Cryptex, which are fairly standout. Compared with other noble type choices as well, he doesn't have a resurrection orb either. His main buff does also sort of imply that a squad is going to be locked up but not destroyed for his main use, maybe a little bit less reliable than it was post-codex given the stacking reanimation buffs isn't quite as big, but I still think for 40 points he does bring a fair amount of value, I've chosen to rate him a 7 out of 10 here. Lastly, for the Noble Overlord sort of choices, we've got the Catacomb Command Barge, 150 points for an Overlord on a fancy hover platform. He's got kind of okay durability with his 4 plus invulnerable save and a minus 1 to wound built in, a little bit of shooting and melee, and his two major buffs are an aura of plus 1 objective control which can be kind of handy to ward against battle shock, and a 1 use res orb for nearby infantry and mounted units, so he could use that boost on things that couldn't normally get a resurrection orb. As a fairly big and tanky generic character as well, he could be interesting for certain enhancements that just amp up his raw damage or durability say the Feel No Pain Enhancement from Awakened Dynasty. For downsides, he is just fairly costly for what he does, I think. 150 points isn't standout for his damage or defence, and his boost that he gives to nearby units I don't think are standout, 
The objective control is handy but often not relevant, and the resurrection orb just once per game. Overall, I've chosen to rank him a 5 out of 10, maybe a little bit more if you've got his attachment that's got a particularly good enhancement for him. Next up, we're moving on to the Cryptex, and first up we have the Technomancer, a 55 point character choice that grants a feel no pain to his lead unit, quite likely Wraiths. He certainly feels like he's a lot more effective on race than one wound infantry, given that multi damage attacks mean that the feel no pain isn't as relevant. As well as that, he also heals d3 wounds to a unit, again, very strong for the race, which might easily take damage but not be fully destroyed. Quite a lot of potential resurrection type thing is if he can heal those wounds and then reanimate. He can bring enhancements to the unit, perhaps most notably the big infiltrate in Canoptic Court, though he can get extra damage there, or Stealth in Awakened Dynasty. Otherwise he has a little bit of damage with his Staff of Light, and has the Cryptek keyword for the Canoptic Court to give full rerolls to that Wraith unit. Overall for what he does, I think he's amazing value for 55 points for a Wraith unit, I'd argue not really quite so stand out for the one wound infantry battle line choices though, far more competition with things like Chronomancers or Plasmancers or other stuff there. Still though, really strong, I'd rate him a 9 out of 10. Next up, we have the Shooty Harbinger of Destruction Cryptek in the Plasmancer. 55 points to grant critical hits on a 5 plus to his lead unit, both strong for Plasma and Gauss. That pairs pretty excellently with anything that grants full rerolls, and just about every detachment can get that for things like Immortals or Warriors. Super easy in Canoptek Court, of course, and Hypercrypts can get it with an enhancement with teleporting around a bit. With Tesla Immortals, that could be a lot of extra sustained hits. And with Gauss, it could help them auto wound a lot of tough stuff. Beyond that, he also contributes to firepower with his strength 7 and damage 2 lance attack, plus a few mortal wounds as well, so contributes quite nicely there. Overall, if you just want flat more damage out of warriors or immortals, he'll definitely do that. I guess for weaknesses, you do want to actually have to want to build around the battle line Necron units to do damage in the first place, which might not always be everyone's first thought. He's got competition with some of the other Cryptex and leaders. And he did have his best combo nerfed with the Canoptic Court Devastating Wound Stratagem. Still, though, I think he's very usable, particularly perhaps for Tesla Immortals. I've chosen to rank him an 8 out of 10. Next up, we have the Cryptek of Time with the Chronomancer. He grants minus 1 to hit for his lead unit. Maybe a nice durability boost for Immortals in particular, given that they've already got an okay save. And his other boost is to allow a move shoot move maybe moving Necron Warriors or Immortals 10 inches within one turn, or allowing tricks like pocketing out of a Ruin, shooting, and then fading back within. Could be quite nice with the Hypercrypt detachment as well, meaning that you could deep strike in, shoot something, and then move, maybe getting your units to unusual positions on the board. Otherwise, he is pretty cheap, brings a little bit of Strength 5 and AP-1 threats to add to his units, and of course super helpful in Canoptic Court like the rest of them, granting his rerolls. Again, I feel like for the boosts for his points cost, he is really very good indeed. Again, maybe if there's any criticism, just having to be forced to build around Immortals or Warriors as your way to play, as opposed to units that can deal a bit more damage to heavier stuff. Overall though, I've chosen to rank him an 8 out of 10. Next up, we've got the Psychomancer. 55 points for the Spooky Scary Skullman with the Battleshock tricks. He contributes two actually fairly interesting battle shot mechanics to the game. Any enemy units that are somewhat depleted within six inches of them in their command phase must test battle shot at a minus one, and then you can also make an enemy unit within 18 inches test in your own command phase. Due to both of these triggering in actual command phases, they do actually both have the potential to flip an objective for your opponent to yours, and that could be really quite big as it could directly lead to some victory points. Otherwise, gets a single strength 6 and damage 3 attack at range of melee, and does cryptic damage buffs in Canoptic Court. I feel like for his main weakness though, it's just kind of hard to deliver those Battleshock debuffs. Ideally, he wants to be right on the front line and covering objectives with that aura, but then you've got the choice of whether or not you run him solo, in which case he's just ridiculously easy to kill if he's ever exposed, or buy him a dedicated immortal or warrior squad to escort him to where he needs to be which feels like that's kind of overkill for what he's bringing, and gives you an 125 point unit or so. Overall, I feel like he's maybe an interesting sort of tech type piece in competitive lists, that very good fine skill players might well be able to get some value of, 
but I feel like it's going to be kind of underwhelming to people playing in a more casual meta, where just more raw damage and defense might make more sense. I've chosen to rank him a 6 out of 10 here. Lastly for the crypt text, we have the two named characters, the first of which is Orican the Diviner. 80 points to see a bright future for your warriors or immortals to give them a 4 plus invulnerable save. After the two, the warriors probably care more about that given that they've got a worse save in the first place. Having a big warrior block have be able to tank half of enemy fire for guaranteed is rather cool. Otherwise he has a bit of his own damage output going up to a single turn of really big damage where you declare that these stars align in melee. Could be kind of punishing for an enemy unit trying just to lock up a warrior squad and getting hit back by a big sting in the tail. For downsides, he costs more than the other durability cryptex at 80 points. A less invulnerable save being more meaningful on warriors maybe isn't ideal at their current points cost, given that immortals are often preferred. Still though, useful enough on his own data sheet, I think. I've chosen to rank him a 7 out of 10 here. Lastly for the cryptex, we have the really big one in Illuminor Seras. The Necron Mad Scientist costs 160 points. An interesting and perhaps surprisingly fighty profile with a bunch of strength 9 and damage 3 attacks both at range and melee and lone operative protection if he's within 3 inches of another Necron unit so it can be hard to deal with for the enemy unless they get super close. His defensive stats are fairly impressive as well at Tovernus 8, 9 wounds with a 2 plus save, hard to take down there and then he has a very standout buff particularly good for immortals worsening enemy AP against them which is nice with their 3 plus saves and giving them a little bit of AP when they shoot things. Again, as with basically the rest of the cryptex, it does mean that you're wanting to build around immortals or warriors. I feel like you do need to build around him as part of the list within taking him. You want to take a few squads that he could boost. And otherwise, I feel like you need to make sure you're getting good use of both the buffs and his damage and defense to actually make him worth it. Just one in isolation probably isn't enough. Still though, since he dropped down to 160 points, I think he's quite interesting. Certainly is played in competitive lists from time to time. I've chosen to rate him an 8 out of 10. Lastly, for the Necron characters, we've got the Destroyer characters. First up, the Scorpec Lord at 100 points. He grants lethal hits to his regular Scorpec charges. Kind of nice with their inbuilt rerolls they can get, as you might get a few more of them. And then also contributes to allowing them to punch up with his own big damage 3 melee, and he could profit from their reroll ability as well. Otherwise, he's fairly big and beefy, a pretty good defensive stat line, and he is a very focal character for Annihilation Legion, a good choice for enhancements there, given that the Scorpet Destroyers are pretty much the focal unit. For downsides, Scorpet Destroyers and Annihilation Legion unfortunately aren't considered to be the strongest Necron units out there at the moment. The detachment doesn't really offer things to other stuff, and the Scorpet Destroyers are maybe still just a bit overcosted. His buffs to them seem proportionate for the points and maybe not stand out good value on top of them maybe. Certainly if you did build him with a big unit of 6 Scorpec Destroyers, you make a unit that's not particularly tough for the cost. The right sort of firepower could remove a lot of valuable Necrons very quickly. Overall, I've chosen to rate him a 6 out of 10 here. Next up, we've got the Locust Lord. 80 points for a Hover Destroyer body to boost the ranged Destroyers. His main buffing rules are to give you critical hits on a 5+, plus, which is particularly nice for lethal hits on regular locusts, given that they're low strength and can get the option of full hit rerolls, so you might get a whole stack of auto wounds there. Otherwise, it can be nice to bear enhancements for them for hypercrypt, has a bit of his own personal damage, and can get a resurrection orb as well, which could potentially restore at least one destroyer from the dead. For downsides, it does require going at least fairly all in on the unit, you need to have a big enough unit to really justify his involvement, so a unit of 3 heavies or perhaps more likely 6 regular locusts. If you're going for the heavy destroyers, he's probably better off on the enemetic exterminators, given that extra lethal hits with gauss isn't quite as meaningful, they tend to wound most things on a 3 plus anyway. Overall, for the right unit and the right detachment though, I think he's solid. I've chosen to rate him a 7 out of 10. I think it's fairly interesting leading a big squad of regular locusts, getting one of the interesting enhancements from the Hypercrypt Legion, and warping around the board to get them in range. Lastly for the Necron characters, and the core index is the Hexmark Destroyer. He's 70 points and is a cheap loan operative with Deep Strike. In general, being a cheapish loan operative is pretty good value. They can be popular for warping in to do secondaries and things, also just lurking in the backfield and doing a bit of screening that the enemy can't interact with. 
In Awakened Dynasty, it could be interesting to bear the Fatal Subjugator to give everyone that plus one to hit. And for his own damage output in the right matchup, it can be kind of important. Lots of shots that punish one wound infantry quite well, that have okay AP and ignores cover. Free Overwatch that hits on a 2 plus, and a return fire mechanic that's still useful, even if it's far more limited compared with what it was pre Codex. For weaknesses, his damage output just isn't really all that strong still. Strength 6 and damage 1 just won't worry certain big tough things with multi wounds, and for that reason, I wouldn't really over invest and just focus on his utility power as opposed to the damage dealing, unless you happen to be fighting against some very costly one wound infantry. Overall though, I still think he's interesting enough. I've chosen to rank him a 7 out of 10. Finally for our forces of living metal, we come on to the Forge World data sheets. First up, the Canoptic Acanthrites, a sort of Bailey Wraith-like type unit with 85 points for 3 of them. They're the other cheap option for having an infiltrate unit competing with flayed ones for that role to start in the midfield. And they do have some interesting advantages. They move fast with 12 inches. They've got a little bit more durability than flayed ones with toughness 5, 2 wounds and a 3 plus save, and some interesting threat of their own sort, some strength 5 claws and basically melter gun style shooting. Their special rule is to allow you to get a debuff on an enemy unit that grants you extra AP on critical hits for the rest of the turn. Certainly not unhelpful, though I'd argue it's not really huge, maybe best on things like low AP Tesla. For weaknesses, I still feel like the flayed ones, they're paying a premium for setting up in the midfield. They're not really particularly tough for the cost still. Their damage output is just bad really unless they're in Canoptech Court. Those full rerolls I think gets them to the point where they're kind of so-so. And if you did just want a minimum investment to hold a midfield point, then flayed ones will do that for cheaper. Again though, particularly in Canoptech Court, for just a cheap unit to start in the midfield, they're not awful for the cost. Weighed up against flayed ones and other utility units like scouting tomb blades perhaps. Otherwise, for some slightly bigger Canoptech creations in the Forge World range, there's the Canoptech Tomb Stalker, a monster choice that's 130 points, this one giving you some sort of okay damage against light to medium infantry with these slicers at range and some claws in melee. For other interesting things, he gets inbuilt deep strike, a gloom prism with the old wording with a 4 plus feel no pain against psychic, and a free heroic intervention. As with anything with a Canoptech keyword, it'll be better in Canoptech court compared with outside. Unfortunately though, I don't think that even full rerolls to hit are good enough to make this thing's damage output good. It's just pretty bad against anything that's got a high save or toughness 6 plus, and it isn't really stand out against its ideal targets either. The heroic intervention is kind of rarely relevant given its melee profile. Most of the time it's not likely to just swoop in and rip apart an enemy unit that wasn't expecting it. I feel like if you've got 130 points to spend in a Necron army, you're probably going to get better out of other Canoptech data sheets, either Wraiths or Doomstalkers for the same sort of price brackets. Overall, I'm kind of unenthused about these. While there are 130 points, I've chosen to rank this a 4 out of 10. For the other variant of Tomb Centipede, we've got the Tomb Sentinel. This one's 115 points, and I think a bit more interesting between that lower price tag and a more threatening shooting attack. This one attacks with a strength 10, AP 2 and damage 2 shooting profile that could get up to AP 3 if it shoots something on an objective. It also is a bit tankier on objectives itself as well, worsening enemy AP there. Again though, it's still not standard unless you've got Canoptic Court rerolls, which I think just about limp it into being okay shooting damage. I'll certainly be weighing it up against the big strength 14, higher AP and damage of the Doomstalker. And unlike the Canoptech Tomb Stalker, it doesn't actually have that much melee at all. So perhaps more than most doesn't want to be getting locked up in combat. I've chosen to rank it a 5 out of 10 overall, maybe a bit higher up to 6 in Canoptech Court perhaps. Next up we've got the Arcane Tesseract Arc, 130 points for a fairly general purpose Necron damage dealer. For that cost you get a medium speed vehicle with quantum shielding. Strength 9, AP 3 and damage D6 plus 1 shooting with D6 shots or swapping that out for a torrent attack which could be quite nice with overwatch when combined with its two secondary weapon guns. For 130 points I'd rate its damage output as just kind of mid really. Definitely not awful and can be threatening enough against anything that isn't toughness 10 or more. Though between being a forge world model and just not really particularly standout as a necron damage dealer they don't really tend to see much play. 
I've chosen to rank it a 6 out of 10 overall, maybe somewhat similar in power to the Annihilation Barge with its different sort of rules. Finally, for the biggest, baddest and most points intensive Necron unit that the army has access to, we've got the Seraptek Heavy Construct, 540 points as a Titanic Walker. This guy is basically somewhat equivalent to a Necron Knight. Big damage weapons that are capable of tangling with enemy heavy tanks and other super heavies. And of course just an absolutely enormous investment unit that can be a good target for any stratagems or buffs that can affect it quite well. Things like the Phasal Subjugator or a Tomb Spider could have some good value. Its defensive profile is pretty impressive and can cause problems for enemies without a serious amount of anti-tank. Definitely a big bully unit that should be able to make its presence felt. For weaknesses, it doesn't really get on well with terrain with its very big profile and can be hard to hide in any sort of meaningful way. It will be competing with the other fairly good Necron Super Heavies, which I think are mostly fairly playable, particularly the Monolith, which I think maybe overall has the better balance of damage and defense for 200 points less. It also does come with the Battleshock rule that it gets, which I'd say is pretty weak for the immense size of the data sheets. Overall, maybe just a unit that's perhaps a little bit too easily countered and doesn't quite do enough raw carnage for a massive 540 points. I've chosen to rank it a 5 out of 10 here. I maybe could have been tempted to push it up to a 6 if I was feeling a bit more generous. In any case though, with 412 things talked about, that just about brings us to the end of our look at Necron units for Warhammer 40k at the moment. Let me know your thoughts on these and which ones you've been most enjoying playing in-game currently. I feel like at the moment there is maybe a bit too much skew to just a few key units, perhaps Wraiths and Mortals and Catan being particularly standouts. I feel like Catan could probably use a points increase, though it would be nice to see some help for some of the struggling data sheets like Necron Warriors or maybe Triarch Praetorians. It would be nice to see Scorpec Destroyers return as a bit more of a credible frontline unit as well. In any case though, look forward to hearing your thoughts down in the comments below as per normal. Let me know if there's any other fun pros or cons that I missed. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I'm sure we'll have more for the Necrons in the future. But I do tend to post something for 40k just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page. And that's the main way that I can continue to post quite so regularly with this. Thanks to the generous backing of people who are enjoying the videos. I do try and give some rewards to people who support the channel on Patreon and keep these videos coming, including seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.